my name is Abby Shapiro. I'm the HIV Clinical Testing Coordinator for the Midwest AIDS Training and Education Center at Eskenazi Health. And um, as I told just a few months ago, I was the Linkage to Care Program Manager at the Damien Center, which is the oldest and largest AIDS service organization here in Indiana. And we're, this webinar is really going to focus on the work that I did um, at the Damien Center and I have with me. Sorrel Parker. I am program manager here at Brothers United, a community-based organization that focuses specifically on working with the black LGBT community. Um, prior to becoming program manager about four months ago, I was a linkage to care specialist for the previous three years. Mary, do you want to advance the slide for us? Sure. Okay. Um, so Um, 
male, uh, and 15 of them were male, female, transgender. Um, about a little over a fourth of the people had less than a high school education. 20% had a high school diploma or equivalent. 20% had some college or technical school. Um, and almost all of them lived at or below the poverty line. Um, I think what's really of note, um, although the, many of the people who engaged in the program had, you know, the viral ones, when they began at over a million, they, uh, they were able to very quickly, through you know, engagement in this program, um, to become undetectable for many within the first six months of, of engagement in the program. And by the time that the research project ended, there were, um, almost all of them had an undetectable viral load and have been able to maintain that. Um, Mary, if you want to change the slide, you can see here uh, the, the really just, this, this slide really is something that I'm very, very proud of. Uh, we were really able to very successfully engage people in care and um, help them to stay retained in care, uh, prescribed with antiretroviral drugs and um, attain a suppressed viral load. And, and we were really, we were able to, are able to um, continue at this level today. And um, in comparison to the national HIV treatment cascade, you can see that um, it certainly is higher, much more <laughs> Uh, much more successful than we see on a national level. So, so we're going to get in um, to how to how we were able to engage the community to begin this program, and then um, and then above and beyond that, how to engage clients. So, we're going to view and to the building community or building community buy-in. Are you there? Yes. Yes, we are on slide eight. Yes. It's working? Okay. <laughs> it's hard to tell up this slide. So okay. Um, so in terms of how we um how we started this program, we we worked through a lot of of startup challenges. Um because the Damien Center was is, and this is really common, I think, across the board, is that um, many AIDS service organizations are competing for the same funding sources and the same client base. And that really meant that we had some significant challenges in, in just getting anybody to support this program in the beginning. Um, you know, even in the beginning, I had problems engaging with Brothers United to get them on board, even though they were, uh, you know, identified as one of the grantees. Um, but just, there was, uh, there's, there's just a lot of, of physical concern. And the, the best way that I was able to really address that challenge was to just continually meet with management of these various agencies and local and state health departments. Um, and help to, the more that I could explain the program and the goals, we all have, you know, we're all seeking to decrease the, the community viral load and best serve people living with HIV. So finding that, that common space at the end. And then, you know, really helping to under, helping people to understand that there's, that, you know, that we just want to try to, to make an impact and, um, and for the Damien Center, you know, one of the big challenges in the community was that um, that people thought that we were going to take these out of care lists and um, you know bring everybody into the Damien Center, and that's just simply not something that we would have been able to accomplish, nor something that we could sustain. We didn't have the staff for it. It was something that we really hoped to do in partnership with um, with the other in service organizations and infectious disease providers um, and in collaboration with the state and local health, the health departments. And it was just something that, that really, it just took time. 
we really didn't have a lot of models of what successful language care programs looked like. And, and so people who are starting programs now are at a little bit, you know, better space because there's some things that work and there's some agencies that have experience and hopefully we'll be able to kind of you know, provide you some of that, that support as you move into developing your own program. Um, and like I said, having, uh, being able to really clearly define and explain the goals of the program was really helpful. Um, it, it is different than um, EIS. It is different than care coordination, but it works in partnership with those things. And, um, and for us, it really looked like the linkage specialists were responsible for providing an additional layer of support to EIS and to care coordination and to infectious disease providers. Um, another thing that we came across as we were developing it was um, really, really intense uh, HIPAA concerns because people thought, well, if we give you, um, our, how can we provide you with an, an out of care list? These are HIPAA, you know, HIPAA controlled. This is a, patient, you know, patient level information, how can we provide that to you? And I actually had to meet with, with lawyers at various hospitals and look through that. What we found or what they found was that because here in Indiana, when someone enters into HIV care, they sign a, um, a consent form allowing them to, for us to share information among a service organization. So if you're able to, to find that you have existing documents that allow that, that sharing of information, that's really going to help you to move forward and address those concerns. Right. So moving forward into strengthening community buy-in, this, um, this was our once, once we had a little bit of, of support from, from the community, um, it, it was really, really important for us to, to document those successes um, and really specifically be able to identify client stories and have data that, um, that I could share in a way that people could understand. Um, and it was really important for us to be able to do that. Um, in terms of uh, finding opportunities to share information. Once I had, I was starting to gather data and having these, these successes I could document, um, I, I looked to, to meet with a service organization for their staff meetings um, and trying to share a little bit of information with them about the program, how it was working, what it really looked like on the ground. Uh, and we also presented at local Ryan White Council meetings and um, the state HIV advisory council. One thing that uh, that the linkage staff really um, it talks to when they, when they talk about how it was really useful for them to build build relationships with those partner agencies was that they actually and this was part of their training was that they had to shadow the staff at various infectious disease clinics and AIDS service organizations. And maybe Terrell can talk a little to that. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and jump right in. So um, definitely one aspect of my training that was beneficial for me is a role to also help facilitate their relationship between community partners was going to the different AIDS service organizations and shadow the staff. It was kind of twofold. One, so that the agency get a feel for the individuals that they're working for, but also so that we get a feel for those individuals as well. Because of clients oftentimes rely on your word or your expertise. So it's great to be able to know the people that work in those organizations that you can be able to say that you as an individual trust those organizations and you are kind of in a better position when you're working with clients to make me new engaged in care. Who's best to refer the client to? Our program works because it's that specific. We don't just focus on referring someone to an agency or an organization. We know specific people down to which medical case manager and which nurse practitioner would be best for working with that individual client. So once we started putting, um, definitely shadowing and going and getting to know their staff, and then also getting to know what the office climate like, what the environment, what's the process like, 
referrals to the program, they were able to, because they, they had gotten to know the linkage specialist, they were able to make specific recommendations saying, I want to make a referral for specifically spirituality because they thought that this would be the best, best fit um, person. And, and when we were creating the linkage specialist team, we really specifically sought out people um, who, who we thought would be able to engage with the clients in a very real way so that looked like them or had similar life experiences. Um, and so, so we had on our staff, um, you know, someone who was 16 years in recovery so that she could really be able to work with, really successfully work with, with clients who, who struggled with addiction. And, and she understood it on a, on a real and, you know, deep level. Um, and that's not to say that the rest of the Wicked staff did not, I mean, they certainly worked with, with people with, uh, with substance use um, issues, but, but she was able to, you know, to connect with them in, in a different way. And sometimes that's what was, was needed. We also made sure that we had a linkage specialist who was Spanish speaking so that she could, you know, that she could communicate with, with some of our clients who uh, were primarily Spanish speaking. Um, in terms of other ways that we tried to engage the community, we tried to um, make sure that as, far, as much as possible, make sure that, that the community knew about the program. And we did um, high level, um, like large scale advertising on billboards and on bus ads. We used um, like on bus ads, we did in bus ads. Um, we also did, had, ran ads in uh, local gay newspapers. There's a number of um, gay nightclubs here that have um, closed circuit TVs that run, you know, various pictures <laughs> just on a loop. And we were able to get ads embedded into that. Um, and and then, you know, the local papers also did um, interviews with us. And then we also looked to really much more non-traditional outreach spaces. Um, and one of the things that we were able to do really successfully was engage with the ballroom community. And that's something that um, Brothers United has done um, very, very successfully. And uh, it's kind of always speaking with to, to engage with, with that community um, and help them to become leaders in, in different ways in the community. And I, just, I can kind of speak to some of the effects of working with those specific gatekeepers. So me, I am a young black condition. I don't know if I still fit the CDC guidelines. I'm about to be 28. But at the time when I came into the position, I believe I was 24. I don't think I didn't even turn 25 yet. So I was in the community, of the community, pretty well known, but people didn't quite know if they could trust me. So even myself being a part of the community, integrated into the community, still didn't quite have that trust factor that's needed to build and sustain this program. So working with those initial gatekeepers kind of gave me the way in. You know, I would call someone, uh, they might call, let's say, Opie, who worked in our ballroom program at the time, and they would say, hey, this guy named Terrell called me Brothers United. Is he okay to talk to? And sometimes just having that buy-in helped to get my foot in the door. And also, I would say, having access to the trans community. At the time, my supervisor was a trans woman, and that also helped me to gain access to the trans community, very similar. Um, I didn't know how to connect with someone, or I didn't necessarily know how to reach someone. She would be there and also um, grant me that access. And one of the great things that we found is those relationships, a lot of direct referral came from word of mouth. People in the ballroom community started yeah. talking. They said, hey, we went here. This person got us reconnected to care. You should go see this person also. That's definitely one of the benefits of having gatekeepers and knowing who the gatekeepers are, the rulers, the shakers. And sometimes just want to stress that it's the non-traditional gatekeepers of 
people who we may not necessarily see as leaders, how we view leaders, but they're leaders in their community and they can grant you access to that population. Yeah, and the, the picture on this slide is um, is me and uh, and Mother Lou at a at a ballroom event, and that was something that I found. Um, you know, it certainly it's not a, a space that I would traditionally be part of, and because I built such a strong relationship with gatekeepers of that community, they wanted me there, and I and it was important that I made an effort to be there. That was something that that I did on a you know <laughs> pretty frequent basis was was attend uh, vote nights and and then also the actual balls and and the, the keep showing up was was so important is so important it's something that um, and because I was showing up um, I, you know it, it really helped to to strengthen that that relationship with that community and um, and it really helped and and not only were they able to kind of check in and see if Terrell was valid, but it really showed um, it showed them that that I was I was invested in their community, and um, and that that really made a difference, and and it allowed the gatekeepers to to make referrals directly to me very frequently when someone would show up in town, um, you know, from Atlanta and moved to Indianapolis, had been part of the ball community and, um, you know, didn't, you know, had to, and they, they found out that, that they were out of care, they would right away, you know, they would call me and say, Abby, you got to hook this guy up. And, you know, and then I would. And, um, and so because we built these, these strong relationships, uh, we were able to really successfully engage with that community in a way that, you know, I think was very unique and, um, and very successful. Personally. I just wish Abby would have posted the picture on this part of her doing a thing at one of the little parts. <laughs> but I think it's important to highlight that because not only did Abby show up, she was engaged and not just engaged you know, on the sidelines, not just engaged watching, but if they called her out to walk the runway at a vote block, she walked the runway. If they wanted her to serve on the panel as a judge, she served on the panel as a judge. So I think that really, really helped because not only was she um, active and present, but she was also engaged as well. And I have friends that say, Terrell, you're too busy, so I'm just going to call Abby if I don't know what about this. So <laughs> that definitely, definitely helped. We certainly were able to work well together. And then it's also great to have a degree of separation. I know it's, it works well to have the peer professional model, but in some instances that can be intimidating for some folks. We know people who are well and active in the community, but so sometimes it's great to have someone who's a little more distant as well. I think Abby started that role. Yeah, that was definitely something that as we were getting referrals, we had to figure out, you know, because Terrell was so connected to to the young black MSM community, we oftentimes, you know, I would have to call him and say, hey, do you know this person when I would get a referral? And, um, and he would say, yeah. <laughs> and then we'd have to decide whether or not it was a, you know, if it was going to be um, a good relationship for uh, to be able to keep it professional or if they were too close um, in a, you know, because of their community partnerships. Um, and, and so that's something that is, it was really important for us to have a diverse linkage staff so that we could really make sure that, the, that each client was getting the right fit person. And we knew that if we got them connected with not only the right linkage specialist, but the right care coordinator and the right nurse practitioner and the right pharmacist, that that was really what was going to help that client engage in care and then stay in care. So that moves <laughs> so us on to um, Talking a little more about how did we engage clients, how do we engage them, and how do we help them to maintain in air? Um, and for us, we found that there were, uh, I think, I don't know, connecting with, with potential clients, um, that there were a couple of key things, and um, on slide 12 right now, very just in case, we're on slide 12. All right. Yeah. So one of the main things that we looked for when um, trying to figure out what did this program need to look 
like in order to really successfully engage clients. And, and for us, that really meant, um, I think the linchpin of all of this was to meet clients where they were or where they are. And that means both physically and mentally. Um, one of the things that um, when creating this program, I, it was really, really important to me that um, that when making an initial contact with a client, you're making, um, trying to build that initial rapport was that the clients needed to identify where do they want to meet with this stranger. Uh, and, it, and it could be in their house, it could be in, you know, in a McDonald's down the street, it could be in a library, it could be, you know, wherever, but really making sure that the clients were given ownership of, um, of just even from that very beginning. And, um, and that's super important because it puts the client in the center. And sometimes clients have a great relationship with our agency. Sometimes clients have had not more favorable relationships with our agency for whatever reason. And sometimes clients just simply are not willing to be here. So I think it really shows that we're willing to go the extra mile with the client first. When we say, hey, you understand, you may not have an issue. You may have an issue with our agency. You may just feel uncomfortable because of the thing. We've had a client, for example, her biggest issue was the thing. She was terribly afraid to come to the day business, or terribly afraid to come to Brothers United, but she didn't want to be seen. We caught profile well known in the community. The stigma was the biggest issue. Just meeting her at home two or three times was enough to work through some of those stigma-related issues until she felt more comfortable coming to the day business or coming to Brothers United. So that's just an example of why it's very important if you have to be at McDonald's, if you have to be at Starbucks at a, at a client's home, it really does make an impact on whether or not they want to be engaged in care. Right, and that's kind of the, the physical <laughs> meeting of where they are. And then um, for the, the sort of mental piece of that is um, making sure that they understand that, that you're not there to judge them. Um, and something that I, I tried to make clear to the staff um, was that they didn't need to, that, that although our goal, our ultimate goal of the Lincolnshire Care Program was to re-engage people in HIV medical care, it didn't mean that that meant tomorrow. It meant, you know, when that client was ready. If they have, um, you know, if they have an active substance abuse issue, if they're homeless, if the ends are homeless, and, 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 they have a lot of things going on, and that's why they're not in, they're not successfully engaged in HIV care. And so making sure that the clients understood that, you know, it was, it, it was going to be allowing them to identify what is their number one barrier, and that linkage specialist is there to help them address that barrier. And that's not gonna, and that doesn't mean that, you know, Terrell didn't work really hard to engage people in medical care and to keep talking to them about that, but it might not have been the thing that, that he worked on with them at first. The very first thing, obviously, was just to build rapport. And, and through that building of rapport, then really working toward the ultimate goal of getting them re-engaged in medical care, but not necessarily, you know, but really allowing clients to, to guide what care was going to look like for them. Um, and so a couple of things that kind of go along with that is um, it, making sure that you're asking the right questions in the right way at the right time. So maybe there is so, and I think one of the things that, um, you know, the, the link specialist talked about time and time again are about some of the, the little things that, like, like grabbing onto little tidbits that the clients say and then being able to bring them back um, kind of full circle as the, you know, as the client runs into challenges um, of engaging and then maintaining in care is knowing things about them and being able to, you know, focus, re help them to refocus um, because they have built this rapport. Right, definitely. And I'll just say um, kind of a little plug for an upcoming webinar on motivational interviewing, understanding the right question at the right time and how to ask the question was heavily um, due to our training in motivational interviewing. And then also understanding changes, the speed of change, and understanding some of the verbal and physical cues that you can listen for and look for to understand where a person is at in their change thinking. And I think that um, definitely plays a part in understanding the right type of question. So um, stay tuned 
to yeah, answer. That was definitely part of the, a big part of the training um, for the language specialist was really looking at um, or knowing how to use motivational interviewing as well as really coming from a strength-based perspective um, and an understanding that, that clients, everybody has strengths and, and helping them to, to really harness those strengths and, and use those as you move forward um, to help them to engage in HIV care, um, but also throughout all of their life. Uh, the other thing that I think was really important is just being really well aware of community resources because if people don't fall out of care for no reason. They usually fall out, or such has been our experience, is that they fall out of care for a lot of reasons. And, um, and HIV is, it just becomes a thing that is too much for them or isn't, isn't important enough at that time, um, is that they have so many things going on and, um, that are making it hard for them to survive. And, and so really being aware of um, understanding those compo compounding barriers and then really being aware of of resources, um, either, you know, through the Damien Center, we had access to a lot of resources, but there's also, um, you know, plenty of things that, that we didn't have access to. So, you know, here people have to have a birth certificate, <laughs> um, <laughs> and you can't get a birth certificate if, uh, or you can't get an ID if you don't have a birth certificate, and you can't get an ID if you don't have an address and you don't have two pieces of mail and you can't get insurance and you don't have two pieces of mail. And so it's just having that support um, of someone who's going to walk you through all of those steps for our clients is really important. Definitely. And I always say this, like you should be able to move in all the other services. A lot of the times the other services communicate, they don't always more than likely you will spend the bulk of your time with the client. You will get to know the client probably better than the care coordinator case because you're available to case manager, nurse practitioner, physician, everyone on that person's care team. And you will more than likely be the first person that they call when they're in crisis. Just because they trust you more and sometimes it's out of availability. Um, all of my clients have my cell number on a point in time, so that also impacts it. So if they can't reach their care partner, if they can't reach their health or case manager, and they have a dire immediate crisis need, you're the person that they're going to call. You're the person that they're expecting to resolve it. And a lot of the times you are that person that pulls the entire team together and says, hey, our clients have a crisis. What can you do? Or what resource? I tap every resource. What resource can we um, pull? And I think that makes um, a huge difference knowing that the client has someone in their corner who they need the support the most. Sometimes they need the support the most outside of traditional work hours. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's also, I mean, it's important to note, though, is that, that Terrell, although he was um, <laughs> definitely available outside of uh, traditional business hours, also had to figure out what, what was that appropriate work balance, the work-life balance. And, yeah, and that was something that took time, um, and, and I think, Thank you very successfully learned how to manage that, and uh, I tried to provide as much support as possible with that, but um, there's certainly a learning curve between being available all the time for all your clients and uh, figuring out what I want. Yeah, what is an emergency? Because everything is an emergency oftentimes for our clients, but helping them to learn that as well. Um, but for, for most of our clients, it really was like they had never had this level of support. And that's why they, you know, fell out of care in the first place, was that it just kept being the snowball effect of all of these things falling, you know, just snowballing into, you know, ultimately falling out of care. And so making sure that they were able to, to have someone to really just get them through you know, 
so much of that in the beginning was really helpful. Right. So, Mary, do you want to flip the slide? Um, and I think we've kind of talked through this a little bit, but um, it's really, it's definitely something that, that we worked really hard on was trying to help clients identify and prioritize those barriers to care and risks to maintaining in care. Um, and, uh, and I tried to kind of image the Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs and if a, if a client's basic needs aren't being met, how can we ex expect them to successfully engage and maintain in medical care? And that was something that, um, that I, I feel like we encountered over and over and over with the wish to care clients. Um, that they just, it, you know, if we are expecting our clients to just jump right back into HIV care when they don't have their basic needs met, if they don't have somewhere safe to sleep, if they don't have, um, you know, if they are actively using substances, um, it's just not realistic for them to re-engage in HIV care. And we have to, as providers, we need to be willing to, you know, to understand that and to, to support clients. And, and so we were really fortunate with this program is that we had, we had time to to work with clients, they were engaged in the program for 18 months, um, or up to 18 months, and and so it didn't. We didn't have to. We weren't on a strict timeline for you know trying to reengage them in HIV care right away. Um, you know, for many of them, they did, um, and you know, some of them just needed someone to call them and and say, hey. You haven't, you know, seen your HIV doctor in what looks like three years, um, you know, and then they would say, oh, I know, I've been needing to do this. I needed that push. For some of them, that's all that they needed, and then they needed more support, you know, to actually doing it, but, um, but it was just that, that one call. Whereas, you know, on the other end of that, we had we had clients that engaged, you know, that re-engaged in the program who hadn't been in care in years, and at that point had, you know, viral loads in the millions and um, very limited uh, social support and, you know, unstable housing and and and. So we did have a very specific tool that we use um, during the initial contact, during the initial point of contact, or whenever we go to the before with the client to be able to engage in that survey, and that survey did look at the various of the barriers that are specifically education care, the presentation, um, and some other things that the market is going to talk about, and that screening tool is very, very important because it helps us that um, we used to get specialists identify the client needs, but a lot of times, a lot of businesses can help them identify their own barriers as well because they weren't aware or they cannot fully articulate what their issues were or what the issues that they helped them be engaged in care. And we can go into the next slide and we can talk about that. Um, so as Cheryl was saying, there, so as, because this was a research project, um, we were we were able to kind of talk really specifically about um, the challenges that our clients that we served um, identified, and um, and this is a list of just some of those. But um, we can kind of talk through uh, each of those and kind of what that meant for the challenges for really providing successful care to them or even just initial contact with them. Um, but by and large, the, I mean, far beyond everything was lack of transportation for our clients. Um, and, just, and that's something that isn't unique to Indianapolis. That's something that through this grant portfolio um, is something that our clients um, nationwide are, are facing. And so really trying to figure out how do you best support clients? Is there, um, you know, is there an HIV clinic close to them? And even if there's an HIV clinic close to them and they need to get their social security card 
where is the social security office in comparison to where they live? Um, and so make they need some sort of, of support in order to get there. And that's something that um, we really try to provide transportation as much as possible in a way that wasn't necessarily saying, how, does this relate to medical care? And, um, and thinking that, that things that, that relate to medical care is something really broad. So and maybe Terrell can talk a little bit about about that. Yeah, so transportation is just um, um, overall was one of the largest barriers that we saw. So really these barriers on this really were consistent for the majority of clients that we served. So some of the difficult things that we found, it's not only the easiest thing that I've always said is to get someone to their first medical appointment. That's always been for me the easiest part of the job, but the most difficult part of the job is, okay, after they have gotten into medical care and they take medication and they're starting to get into the pain and we see effects in their viral loss starts to decrease, CD4 starts to increase, and then Communication decreases with the client, that consistent communication that you may have every day. You may go a few weeks, three, four weeks, a month, and then you call the client to check in, and it seems like their life is falling apart. And a lot of times, their life is falling apart because of some of these issues. I have stable housing, but my partner kicked me out, or um, someone shared my HIV status publicly, and now I don't want to take medication. Or I need to make some extra money, so I went on tour for a few weeks. I have gotten arrested while I did some of my sex work, and then I was incarcerated, got back out, and I didn't want to get back on medication. So it was those things that what we started to realize very early on was clients will not be sustainable, they will not remain sustainable. They will not remain here until we address these issues. So part of that initial screening tool was, okay, from C, how do you need a salesman? One bite at a time. That's what I always tell people. So let's not focus on everything. If you want to stay over the next six months, or maybe it's the next three months, or maybe it's the next four weeks, because for some people a six-month goal is just too big. What are the two or three things that you feel are your top priority? What do we need to work on in the first four weeks, the first six months? Then at four weeks or six months, let's reevaluate. Have we hit those goals? Have we really addressed those needs? Do we need to prioritize something else? So it's always putting the client first, understanding what their needs are, helping them to prioritize, setting timely goals, setting times where you check in and not just letting the client um, just kind of drift is a good word. Mm-hmm. Don't just let a client drift. Always have a time where you want to check in. Always have a time where you will reassess those barriers. And then I think gradually you start to see those barriers decrease. If they go from, okay, I'm housed now, I'm in medical care, now I need to find a job. Or I have a job now, I just purchased my car, now I can focus on getting back to school. It's really setting out a plan over the next 18 months or however long to stick to that plan and check it in. And I think it's important to, to note that linkage to care looks really different in different settings. Um, and, and so our program really, I mean, fortunately, we had a, a level of funding that allowed us um, a, a lot of flexibility and, um, and to, to really make, you know, great gains with clients and with the community. Um, in some programs, think of linkage to care as if someone doesn't show up for an appointment, you make one call. Um, and, and, and then that's how they view linkage to care, and that's it. Um, and for us, it was really important that we made these really intense um, connections with clients and, and that we were there for them through, you know, through all of that, and, and that really speaks to what, what Terrell is talking about. 
out is that that as the, the client sort of ebbed and flowed with, but, you know, dealing with these, um, with these major challenges in their lives, they had someone stable that they could go to, um, but also that was going to check in with them. Um, one of the big challenges with that, obviously, is them not having consistent access to phones. Um, that was a big challenge. We sort of mitigated that by, you know, sometimes reaching out to them on Grindr or on Facebook, um, maybe via email if they have if you have consent um, to do that, or helping people learn how to use or get an email address because they would be able to access that um, through at the, at the library. Um, and, and it was just sort of, but also because we were working with um, clients who were transient, knowing their thoughts. And being able to and being willing to go to to their spot, knowing those places where you know where they are doing sex work, or knowing the you know abandoned house that that they sometimes stay at, and and that really is you know the more rapport you can build with a client, the more you're going to be able to know how to reach out to them as they start to drift. Um, and some of these things on the list are things that we've already addressed. Um, we had a lot of clients that had a hard time engaging in the program because of the mistrust that they had of the medical system in the very beginning. Um, they have had, you know, problems where their data, their HIV status was disclosed at an HIV, you know, provider, and, um, and so. That didn't, so they stopped going to, you know, stopped engaging in HIV care, and and it, and that's, you know, and that's a big hurdle, but it's not an insurmountable hurdle. It's something where, you know, that linkage specialist just worked, kept being there, kept showing up, and kept, you know, and eventually got, you know, got that client back into care, and you know, and she has been great. Um, and obviously, HIV stigma, as we've talked about, is being willing to go to them um, and finding ways to to provide care outside of traditional settings. Um, I think lack of prioritizing medical care was a huge barrier for clients who have fallen out of care. And so being someone that can, you know, be to actually be there for the clients and, you know, help to push them a little bit. Um, and not a lot, because they're not going to take it back. <laughs> I think that's been our experience. Um, and limited clinic hours is another big challenge um, that certainly we weren't able to address by <laughs> providing more extensive uh, clinical hours, but we could be, you know, available for clients. That was an especially big challenge for our Latino clients was that they, if you're undocumented, you have to work when you can work. And if you can only work, you know, and you have no time to know <laughs> what your schedule is going to look like, um, but you need that money. And so how do you work around that? And that was something where we really had to make an effort with the clinic at the Davian Center to say, this person is going to be available tomorrow. And being willing to, to have that clinic, you know, make time for them um, or for a care coordinator to do the same thing. And that was something that we really had to push and we really had to advocate for our clients in order to create space for clients to engage in their medical care in a way that works for them. Um, and we talked about being on tour. If someone is, um, you know, needs to be out of town, for, you know, for work or for the ball, like, that's what their life looks like. And you have to be willing to figure out how to make that work for them to be in medical care and being supportive of that because that's what they're going to do and recognizing that that's going to be part of their life. And so rather than being judgmental or saying, no, you need to be here because you have an appointment, that's not going to, that's not enough. <laughs> To, for them to say, oh, okay, I'll be here for that appointment, because their life, their, their livelihood or getting their basic needs met are more important than, than that. So I think that that 
actually sort of wrap up our, our presentation. Um, but if you guys have any questions for us, Hey, Abby and Samora, I want to make sure you can hear me, Abby and Terrell. Yeah. Awesome. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much for that thorough presentation. And thank you, attendees, for bearing with our technical difficulties. I'm glad we were able to get through. We are collecting questions here. I know we're running over, but I wanted to um, give everyone a chance to sort of um, uh, sort of peck uh, Abby and Terrell's brains uh, regarding their really rich, robust experience working with this patient community. So Abby and Terrell, there was one question regarding the chart that you listed earlier with the, uh, the patient information. Uh, one attendee says, you mentioned earlier 187 patients were linked to care. How many uh, patients, how, what, was, what was the total number of patients out of that group? The total what, I'm sorry. You cut out a little bit. Of the 187 people, what? Can you repeat the rest? Hi, Abby, I have the question for you. So initially you all presented in your graph earlier that um, 187 individuals were linked to care, but what was the larger budget? What was the larger number of individuals who were first engaged in the program and then from there, how, um, we know that 187 individuals were linked to the care. Well, um, throughout that, that program, um, that's how many people maintained in care for the, um, for the 18 months. And um, so that number is only, we, we had five more people um, that, that we tried to engage in care who did not successfully uh, sort of engage for that full 18 months. We were, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know, um, you know, how exactly we did it, but uh, it was just, it, we were really, really successful in, um, once we made that, that initial connection with someone, uh, we were able to, to get them to, to re-engage in care, and, um, and it really goes back to not, not pushing that, um, but really trying to, to work with what, what can we do to stabilize them in order to, um, on their basic level, before, you know, getting them re-engaged in HIV medical care. Um, from a, you know, from a, from a city standpoint, you know, we know that there's, you know, hundreds more people who have fallen out of care. Um, this, is, this is what we were able to accomplish in about a three-year period. Yeah, that's been an outstanding as well. Uh, and another additional question, um, what year was the data from that you showed us previously? Um, the program itself began in 2013. So I think the, um, the, the national um, the national HIV treatment testing, I believe, is from 2012. Our that is from you know the the end of this program, so uh, 2015, 2016. Perfect. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, and I think that closes off our question and answer portion of the webinar today. Uh, we don't have any additional questions from um, any participants, but I would like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. Thank you so much, Abby and Terrell, for gifting us with your wisdom and your insight um, for um, particularly increasing engagement and re-engagement among those who have been lost to care. I um, just want to make a brief announcement that our next NASDAQ sponsored his health webinar will take place on May 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this is entitled Practice to Policy, Utilizing His Health Data to Leverage State Policy and Advocacy for Black MSM Patient Communities. So um, thank you all so much for your attendance today. And please follow up with questions. Email us at hishealth at NASDAQ.org. Thank you.